Good afternoon, everyone. Happy New Year. My name is Brad Robinson. I'm the Vice President for Education at the Advanced Studies and Culture Foundation located in Charlottesville, Virginia. Let me welcome all of you to our monthly event. And this is the time we're going to have a, a conversation about the U.S. Department of Education. Since September of last year, we've gathered monthly to meet with scholars, social entrepreneurs, educators, government officials, and others to talk about different issues in education, whether it's K-12 or higher education. With a new administration in place, with new leadership coming into the U.S. Department of Education, many of us want to know what are some of the ideas they should think about. Of course, they have inherited a lot in part due to what uh, COVID-19 has done to our schools, for our educators across the country. But this is also a new opportunity for leadership to think, how can we do things differently? And so I brought together four people who know something about the Department of Education through different parts of their um, professional career. I also want to thank our founder, uh, Dr. Uh, Hunter. Uh, he's done a great job over 25 years, not only creating the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture, but using the research that we have to drive the mission, to make sure that we take what we have and give it into the hands of practitioners and others to make great sense of it. And this is just another example. And so what I'm going to do is to introduce our four panelists, and then we're going to have a conversation. So let me first welcome uh, Melody Arbo. Uh, Arbo, in fact, she's the first time guest to us. Uh, she is the outreach specialist for educationreports.org. She's also the former 2015 uh, winner of the Teacher of the Year Award for Michigan. She's also a educator and she also had an opportunity to work for the US Department of Education as a teacher ambassador fellow, both for the Obama administration and for the Trump administration. Melody, welcome to uh, our seminar. We have Genevieve uh, DuVos, who is also an educator. She's a national board certified educator. We've had a number of them involved with us. She also is a former middle school teacher in Los Angeles, Oakland, and the South Bronx. And she also worked for the U.S. Department of Education as a fellow under the Obama administration. We have Sean, uh, Jean-Claude Brazard, who is a senior advisor and deputy director of U.S. programs at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and also the former superintendent of schools, really the CEO of schools in Chicago. So thank you for joining us. And the last person we have is Professor Kimberly Robinson. She is the Elizabeth D. and Richard A. Merrill Professor of Law at the University of Virginia. And in a previous career, she was an attorney in the U.S. Department of Education in the Office of General Counsel for both the Clinton and George W. Bush administrations. And so we have people here from Clinton to Trump, and we're now going to have a conversation about what takes place moving forward. So again, welcome to our seminar. And the first thing I always like to do is just give everyone who is in our viewing or listening audience, because we're on Facebook Live, and this will also be made available on our webpage, is just to give everyone an opportunity to know something about your personal life. So Melody, I'll start with you. Tell us who's Melody and what attracted you to the field of education? Well, first, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here with this amazing panel. Um, so I am a teacher <laughs> and an educator for life. Uh, I'm also a wife uh, for almost 20 years and a mother to three children. Um, my twins are 11 and my daughter is a freshman in high school. She's 14. Um, so it's been interesting to navigate um, COVID education life. Uh, especially with, you know, having varying needs um, of support for my own kids. Um, I actually never planned to be a teacher when I was growing up. I wasn't one of those, you know, kids who played school and, and dreamt of being that. Uh, I was in college going into a totally different field and got a, a part-time job at an elementary school, which I thought would just, you know, work well with my schedule and uh, sounded fun. Um, but I just instantly fell in love with the school environment. I thought the staff was just wonderful and so supportive. Um, it was amazing to be able to connect with kids and build those relationships um, and, you know, just have their faces light up when they learn something new or when you help them, you know, overcome a challenge. 
And so I, you know, I knew right away that it was what I wanted to do. And within a month of being in that role, I switched my major and focused on education ever since. Um, I taught third grade for my entire career, which was um, over 15 years in the classroom. And at first, I really just focused on my own classroom and the four walls and what I could do best for my students. Um, but then I started to want to, you know, um, make an impact beyond the four walls of my classroom. And it was really before teacher leadership was even a term <laughs> that was used. Um, but I found some opportunities where I was able to connect with like-minded educators. And that was really invigorating to be able to um, hear other people's ideas and share ideas um, and have an influence on you know, the things that we were doing for our students. Um, and that led to these opportunities like the Teacher of the Year program and the Teacher Ambassador Fellowship, where I really had a chance to see how policy works and you know, what leadership and decision making looks like beyond um, our local schools and have always just tried to think about ways that we can elevate educator voice um, and then that led me to Ed Reports, where we work with um, districts, states, and other nonprofits to ensure that all students have access to high quality instructional materials. Um, and that's been great because I've gotten to work with uh, people from across the country and educators and state leaders, um, just to really think about you know, what we're doing for our students and what we're able to provide for them so that they can um, have access to everything that they need to succeed. Well, you're not alone in the number of people who've been on our podcast who said, I never started out to be a teacher. So this is an ongoing theme. So we're going to kick it over to Jenna Babib and see if we have a similar theme or something that's different. Thanks so much, Gerard. And I know we've been practicing. My name is Genevieve. Genevieve. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'll get it correct. It's my whole life. So don't worry. Um, sure. I'm really also really honored and happy to be here. Um, I'm Genevieve DuBose. Um, I am an educator, an artist, an activist. Um, I have been working in schools for the last 20 years, um, mainly as a middle school teacher. Um, as you mentioned in Los Angeles, which is my hometown where I am now, um, but also in Oakland and for a very long time in the South Bronx in New York City. Um, I have taken some of those 20 years have not been in the classroom. One was as a teaching ambassador fellow at the US Department of Education, which was a really powerful learning experience uh, for me. Um, and also as a work, I worked a couple of years at the national board for professional teaching standards. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a national board certified teacher and uh, I got to work to help organize other board certified teachers um, across the country, which was a really uh, wonderful experience as well. And currently, I, um, I've always, well, I've always been drawn back to the classroom. So it's been, I think, also something that has helped me sustain my time in education is being able to step out of the classroom to do some of this policy work or other types of work. Um, I'm now back in Los Angeles, and I work for an organization called the Partnership for Los Angeles Schools. And I am a literacy coach at a middle school um, in Watts, Edwin Markham Middle School. So it's a really wonderful opportunity for me to uh, support our teachers uh, to provide really uh, rich um, and culturally relevant learning experiences. Um, and what really drew me to education, I've always been somebody who loves working with young folks, um, even when I was a young folk. Uh, and when I was in college, similar to Melody, um, I think I was a junior in college, I was working at a local middle school, just tutoring. Um, I wasn't tutoring, I was actually volunteering in a, an eighth grade English class. And I went to UC Berkeley for my undergrad and graduate um, studies. And when I was there um, at this middle school in an eighth grade English class, uh, the teacher had students write like, what college do you wanna go to and why? And I remember uh, one young man, Stanley, he was a young black boy in the class. And he wrote, I wanna go to Berkeley, but I'm, I'm not smart enough to get into Cal. So I'll have to be really good at playing sports. And that just floored me because I was like, why does this young man think that he is not smart enough? What messages you know, has he been sent? Who has been sending these messages to him? And um, I really thought about the impact of a teacher and knowing you know, if I go into to teaching, I can really have an impact on all the Stanleys to remind them how smart, how intelligent, how genius, how creative, um, how valuable they are. And so that was, Many, it was many things, but he really stands out for me as someone who, who pushed me to say, you know what, I'm going to do this and, and to be uh, working in middle schools, which is a really 
wonderful time in everyone's life. And so it's great to have committed educators at the middle school level. As we shared in an email prior to today, I, I grew up in Los Angeles as well, and I am so familiar with that story of the sports to life. Uh, I was one of those people who didn't believe I was smart enough, but reality set in when I got hurt playing football and I had to do something else. So your story is very well. Let's go to Jean-Claude. Who is Jean-Claude and what attracted you to education? Thanks, Gerard. Um, let me start first perhaps with the last part of your question. I often tell people I fell into teaching, but there was a deliberate decision in my life not to become a teacher because I come from a long line of teachers. My, my father was a school principal. My mom was a secondary school teacher. You don't do what your parents do, right? So when you see your whole family doing this, you've got to do something different. But you know, I, I was a chemistry major, a degree in chemistry. Uh, couldn't get a job after college uh, because I didn't know you need a PhD, frankly, to get a job as a chemist. Uh, in New York City at the time was looking for teachers. And we had this thing in New York years and years ago where every August we're short five to 10,000 teachers every single year. It was a scramble to get folks. So took a very short exam, uh, became a teacher, was assigned to Rikers Island to teach. And that changed my life. Uh, met a young man who couldn't do basic computation, couldn't do basic addition, subtraction, uh, 19 years of age, hadn't been in school since the fifth grade. I was 21 and a half years, of, uh, years old. So basically my age, it looked just like me. Within a semester, this young man was doing pre-algebra. Um, and I realized we lost something big, frankly, in the sciences, mathematics, and in our society. So I said, you know, I'm gonna do a few more years of this. I'm gonna go on the other side. Um, to see if I can make a difference. Um, and 35 years later, I'm still in education. I've done just about everything um, in education. I was a, a middle school teacher, high school teacher, high school principal, uh, school superintendent, all the way to Chicago, worked for the college board for a short time on career readiness. Uh, now I work at the Gates Foundation and about the transition to become the president and CEO of Digital Promise. Um, and you'll see much of that sort of DNA in my, in my answers. But again, education is my life. My wife is, is an educator that works also as a philanthropic organization focusing on the whole child. And you see some of that perhaps influence in, in my professional thinking um, as well. But the one thing I do for fun is I am a commercial pilot. Mm -hmm. So whenever I wanna get away from the craziness, I go fly somewhere. And that tends to help me see the world from a different perspective. Thank you. Yeah, you mentioned your wife. Uh, we're actually, his wife and I are in the same uh, horror aspect cohort. And he also mentioned Rikers. Uh, the book over my shoulder, the one that, uh, with the white covers called Education for Liberation, a uh, book I co-edited two years ago. And it talks about education for people who are incarcerated. And that story is so true. And unfortunately, uh, the, uh, our criminal justice system has become a dump off ground for people we've given up on uh, in the education system in so many ways. But that's a, another story for a February conversation that we're gonna have. Kimberly, who's Kimberly and what attracted you to education? Yeah, so first, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here and especially to be on a panel with all these esteemed educators. So that's really exciting. So, you know, I'm currently a law professor at the University of Virginia School of Law, but the path I took to get here really was actually one where I was focused on becoming a civil rights lawyer. So I was raised by a civil rights attorney, my father, did a lot of work on employment discrimination. And so as a kid, I was absorbing these stories about that. Um, and then that intersected with the fact that when, my, when I was in third grade, our parents moved us from a school that was low performing in Maryland to schools in the suburbs of Richmond. And they told us that we were moving, we're moving because we don't feel like your brother and you are getting a good education and we want education is the key to success. And we wanna give you every opportunity for that. So that story really stuck with me. It's interesting. Um, I remember distinctly moving during, like during the school year. Um, but I also remember thinking about, so what about the kids that can't move, right? And so I've always had this sense in education, sort of, but for the grace of God, go I. Like I, I feel very grateful for the opportunities my parents gave me, and I want to give other kids a great education and help be a part of that. And so ultimately, being raised by an attorney, I decided to pursue civil rights work to work on that issue. So. I went to law school at Harvard and then I um, focused practice law for a law firm who that represented school districts and then with the US Department of Education working on civil rights. So I've worked on school funding, I've worked on Title IX, I've worked on race discrimination and all of that with the goal of in, 
helping to expand opportunity and increase quality for all children to make sure that we start to close this opportunity gap that we have that gets a lot less attention than the achievement gap. The achievement gap gets all these headlines. Um, the opportunity gap that causes the achievement gap doesn't. And so my big, one of my big focus is on how should law and policy be structured to support closing the opportunity gap? Um, so that all kids get a great education. So my wonderful husband and I, who is the moderator, um, <laughs> have three daughters <laughs> and uh, live here in Charlottesville and excited to be here. See, you've taken away the punchline. I was gonna wait to the end to say that, but it's okay. <laughs> okay. I, I, there's, two, there's two questions I can't ask you now. We'll look to that later. <laughs> um, but thank you for, really to all of you for joining and giving us a personal view into your life and how you arrived here. So it's January, it's 2021, U.S. Department of Education starting to really staff up, new leader at least announced and we're moving forward. All of you have an experience with the Department of Education. You know, in your mind, your lane, what you're thinking, what are some of the priorities you think um, the new team should take a look at uh, for this year? It's really a group question, so you can just weigh in as you want to. I'll jump in. Um, I really think equity should be a priority. We have a substantial opportunity gap where child, the quality of a child's education is determined by race, income, and zip code. And that just really shouldn't be, and it doesn't have to be. We are one of the only you know, industrialized nations that invest less in low-income children in their education. Other nations invest more in those children to help them catch up with their peers. We really need to restructure educational opportunity so that all kids get an excellent education. And that is even more important with the pandemic and the learning losses that we're seeing, the inequitable access to in-person school, remote learning, all of that. So we are actually even more behind as a result of the pandemic. But before we started this, we had a huge opportunity gap that we need to address. Um, and that's gonna require just a real revision to law and policy and also just how we think about children in school sort of owning, not just our own kids and trying to get our own kids ahead, but all children investing their success. Because when we don't, we pay for it on the back end as well. Professor Robinson, you on mute, Gerard. Sorry about that. You mentioned equity and it's a term that we hear a lot. How do you define equity uh, either through your research or your practice or combination? Yeah, that's a great question. So really equity is about um, driving um, resources to where they're needed. And so equity is trying to address where children have disparate needs that you meet them where they are. Okay, Jean-Claude, so you can weigh in. Yes, yes, I was gonna just piggyback on what Professor Robinson was just talking about. Uh, the fact is that we are facing the probably the most challenging education issues in the last century. Not to say we didn't have problems before, but we now have a giant spotlight, frankly, on all the issues. We are, uh, um, we have an emergency. We've got kids in the emergency room. So I would say the two things we had to do, we would do immediately. So some, frankly, would be long, longer term, but these two things I would do right away. One is looking at the digital gap. The fact that we've been at this for God knows what, 20 years, and we've not fixed this is problematic. And we have modeling now that really can help us understand how to close that once and for all. And I know very specific examples of how this is happening across the country, but as, as a nation, as a federal government, this should be priority, um, maybe priority one and priority one as well, I would argue is a traumatic experience of our kids right now in school. We're seeing the rash of suicides right now. I think Clark County was one of the most recent uh, one making the news. Um, we don't really know how bad this is. We won't know, frankly, uh, for a few more months. We'll be addressing the, the traumatic experiences of our teachers, frankly, and of our kids and families, I would say is, is, is a primary, fundamentally primary thing we have to do. And there are organizations who can do this. I know after the, the um, the shootings in Florida, um, in Broward County, the kind of support from topic organizations, I think CZI in particular, provided to that school district and really addressing the needs of teachers and students around sort of trauma-informed instruction has been, I think, a bit of a game changer for Bob Runty and his team um, in Broward County. That kind of stuff is really critically important. 
if I, if I may give you just two more. One is we've seen now the intersection between health and education. And in our work in Washington State, with the Gates Foundation, we've got our global health team, our education team focusing on specific geographies and doing testing, providing support for school systems, really understanding how to begin to help bring kids back to school. That is a big, big deal. And of course, the Gates Foundation provided funding for HBCUs around COVID testing. So that kind of stuff, frankly, needs to happen, not just K-12, I would argue P-16. Last but not least is that for the first, I think most school systems have some version of a learning management system. Just can you imagine or imagine the amount of information and data that could be gathered from that to really help support the whole child and to make those systems better uh, is something else we can do. And there's a lot of ramifications in that, including data structures, et cetera, we can talk about. But these four things I would, I would argue, first quarter, first two quarters of the administration, they've got to jump on this as immediately as possible. It was good to hear you mention modeling because there are things out there we know yeah. is actually making a difference. So we can take a look. Glad you talked about health. Think about pre-COVID-19, we already had an obesity challenge uh, in many of our schools across the country. Now being home, less sedentary, some other factors. So thanks for that. And I, I, just to add on to that, I think about my time working in the South Bronx, I, I, I had never taught so many students who were who had asthma and the air quality in our community was horrific, which really impacted students' ability to be successful at school. So just thinking, going back to what you were naming as well, Professor Robinson around equity and, and something that is really resonating with me is, um, you know, thinking about the wild and traumatic year we've, we've just experienced collectively as a nation um, and that is, is, is still lingering, right? But, but thinking about um, all the racial reckoning that, that was happening in our country or is happening and to remind ourselves, you know, that black lives still matter in 2021, it makes me think a, a lot about what is possible with, um, you know, there is a, a level of hope for me at least now with the new administration um, and, and reminds me that there is some light uh, and, and it makes me think of, um, you know, our poet laureate, Amanda Gorman, where like there is light if only we're brave enough to see it and brave enough to be it. And so this idea of equity and we, the things that we can do, we can, um, even though we've told ourselves that we can't, um, for me, that's just a reminder of even, I think at the very beginning of, of the pandemic, there was a really powerful webinar on abolitionist teaching and Dr. Bettina Love named, you know, we, we, all the things that people said we couldn't do, we've done overnight, right? We've given kids devices. We've closed that digital divide in some communities. We've ended standardized testing, like, because there was a pandemic. And so it really makes me think, how, how can we, um, how can folks at the Department of Ed really support anti-racist and, and culturally relevant learning, teaching and learning experiences for our schools, right? And we, we can, the department can incentivize certain things. How are we ensuring that, you know, the kids who are educated in our schools really have that sense of worth? Aren't my Stanleys who don't feel like they're smart enough, but are, are having culturally relevant practices um, they're seeing themselves reflected in text. So how do we how do we actually um, make those things the norm in our schools? Because we do have have this really powerful opportunity for that. And I'm glad you mentioned uh, students with asthma because there are a lot of people, some who are watching now, some who listen later, who believe that thing is solved. And we know that's not the case. Right. And you, as an artist, you know the importance of also bringing in arts, absolutely conversation about not only race but of learning. And so there's some dynamics. We talk about STEAM, we often just talk about uh, STEM, we need to talk about STEAM because there's an arts-based component to this. And I think once we continue to move through, uh, arts gonna play a very big role in uh, helping us heal as we move forward. What are your thoughts, Melody? Well, I second uh, everything that the panelists have already said because there have been you know, deep inequities that educators have known about for many years, but they've really been brought to the surface through this crisis and they can't be ignored anymore. So I think, you know, generally everybody knew that they were there, um, but now we have to address them and address them quickly. Um, but as difficult as this situation has been, I really think it's an opportunity to reimagine schools. You know, we've really had the same school structure for over a hundred years. 
And you know, while we're always thinking of ways to innovate and make things better for students, I think we could just kind of start from scratch and look at this to see what worked well for students um, pre-COVID and during COVID, what did not work at all, uh, and what needs to be changed. You know, just having grade levels, having grades in general, um, I think really adds to inequity. So just think, rethinking about how we evaluate students and assess students, um, thinking about how we approach students with different learning needs and our, our, marginalized, our most marginalized students. Um, there was a quote from um, a parent of a child with special needs, um, which I am as well. And she said that the one good thing that came out of this was that she feels other families have seen what it's like for her child to not be able to get the things that they need and to be isolated and to have, um, you know, uh, uh, an interaction with school that's maybe not as positive. And that really struck me because I do think that's the case not only for students um, you know, with IEPs or with special learning needs, but for all of our, um, you know, most vulnerable students. So I would love for this administration to really focus on what do we learn from this and where do we go from here? Because we don't really need to go back to the way it was. There were so many things that were not working um, and really to just listen to educators, listen to parents and listen to the students. Like we've learned so much about our kids, some kids who are thriving um, in this, uh, context and uh, just really thinking about um, individualizing more and getting away from our very rigid structure. Glad you mentioned special education students, students with special needs. We know approximately 10% of the public school students in the United States are special ed students. I think some of those numbers are actually undercount because how we actually define who's special needs, special ed changes with time. But you're right, the number of families who said, aha, uh -huh, so now you're seeing exactly what my family had to go through pre-COVID-19 in our December event. In fact, we had uh, uh, Peggy Brookins, who, of course, uh, you know from, uh, uh, from your board. We also had uh, uh, Director of Respectability who represents families who have disabilities. This is an issue the Department of Ed is going to have to wrestle with in very unique ways, and it's surely going to require not just Department of Ed, but I would say an intra-agency approach, because there's just some things we've got to change. And, Glad you brought that up. Well, it's time for me to just shift more into the individual questions. And I'm gonna start with you, Kimberly, since you had time with the Clinton and Bush administrations. You know, a Department of Education, everyone, Department Federal and State, there's always a general counsel, Office of General Counsel. Uh, school finance, you mentioned other areas. Civil rights. Help us, you know, for those of us who don't know much about Department of Ed, about what lawyers do in there, and about, you know, what particularly a general counsel will do, Walk us through what it was like then, uh, some of the issues you were dealing with, and then how you can take lessons from those two administrations and provide some specifically as it relates to an Office of General Counsel perspective. Sure. So, yeah, I actually, you know, when I was in law school, I hadn't really thought much about going into the federal government, but there's just a really amazing amount of support for education at the U.S. Department of Education and the General Counsel's Office. So it's a large office. I don't know the size of it now. It was over 80 attorneys when I was there, uh, which is a lot of lawyers running around in one building. And it, you know, they're folk, they have different specialties. So they focus on everything from civil rights to student financial aid to ethics, making sure that employees are not violating the ethics rules for federal employees to people who liaison with the Capitol Hill, people who um, support you know, students with disabilities. There's just a whole range of attorneys there who are supporting the department. And generally they're partnered with other parts of the office. So you'll have attorneys who are assigned to the elementary and secondary education office and to OCR and to you know, the legislative, um, you know, those who go over to the Hill and just work with those in Congress on the latest legislation. And so, you know, one of the things I learned while I was there is the tremendous capacity for reform that's present within the U.S. Department of Education. It's a very underutilized office because of um, education federalism in the United States. We really focus on state and local control of education and try to put a lot of guardrails on the federal role. And there's some wisdom in that. You, do, you don't want a one size fits all approach to education. But I think it's also hurting us too because we don't tap into the resources. Like the federal government and the Department of Education has great resources on 
research and data on best practices, on you know, approaches that can help to dismantle the school to prison pipeline, all kinds of things. And I think because we have this very sort of keep the feds at the margin, we lose that ability to invite them in as a partner for technical assistance, invite them in for research, you know, go to them as a, as a resource. And so I, one of the things I'd love to see that the current administration do is to start to see that districts and states would view the department as a partner. We're in this together and we're gonna work to sort of improve education together. And I think that was certainly lost, you know, certainly lost with the former secretary because she was, there was ultimate times when the department was being denigrated. And there's a lot of talent and energy and commitment to education there that I think can be used for good. And so that's something I hope to see happen. In the general counsel office, is it career attorneys only, political appointees or a combination? Combination, yeah. So the top layer is political appointees, but there are a lot of people who've been there for many administrations, which gives them a lot of insight and wisdom to what works and what doesn't. So Jean-Claude, she happened to mention local school districts. Uh, you know something about that. Again, CEO of Chicago Public Schools. You were superintendent in Rochester. You spent a number of years working for the New York Department of Education and also serving in leadership. You know, we all know that a lot of what takes place in DC, ultimately, the rubber meets the road at the local level. From your you know, view as an administrator, superintendent, you know, what are what superintendents thinking right now? What are the things you think they want to see uh, from the, the new team? You no, know, John, it, it's a great, it's a great question. And I can, I mean, I really sort of agree with Professor Robinson. You know, when I was in Rochester, New York, or New York City, we had great partnerships with the DOE. In New York City, because of the size of the system, they had no choice, we, we had to engage each other. But I remember when I was in Rochester, Ani Duncan and others made a concerted effort to reach out to superintendents through our associations, right? ASA or the Council of Great City Schools. We had these monthly conversations about the work. And I remembered very clearly when I was battling my in-school suspension, or out of school suspension issues, it, nearly 18,000 suspensions a year in a system of 34,000 kids. Um, and, and we saw the school to prison pipeline very clearly. And by the way, 18,000 suspensions for 6,000 kids suspended 18,000 times. Half of those kids had IEPs. So you can see the intersection between IDEA and everything else. And we had a ton of support. In fact, they sometimes cover from the DOE and our uh, state education department in allowing us to do what we had to do physically to change that 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 direction and narrative in in, in, the, in the city. So greatly um, um, appreciative of the kinds of resources you see at the DOE. But let me start to your question, Gerard, by talking about maybe what Michael Fullen refers to as the three stories of school reform. So the inside story, the inside outside story, the outside inside story, which basically says that one cannot exist with, without the other. The DOE in Washington, D.C. will never be successful with, without the education department in the state or, frankly, without superintendents. When you look at all the capital we spend on teacher evaluations, not much change in practice. I think basically and because local superintendents were now deeply engaged in that conversation with their team and their staff to really make sure that policy connects to practice in a way that was really, really meaningful. So that and, and, and so the issue, the, the idea that complex issues require comprehensive solutions is a big challenge for local leaders. We, we are not incentivized to look at the breadth of the issue. We held accountable, in my opinion, to a myopic definition of success, which is reading a math course, right? Uh, I'm not saying it's not important. I'm not saying we don't struggle to get that done, right? But the fact is that if that becomes a North Star for many local leaders, by the way, I know it's not the North Star for my children, and I'm sure for many of you, if you have kids, it's not the North Star for you. It's an expectation of a means to an end, but the, the redefining success as being sort of a longer play is something I think that can be messaged to a lot of folks from the DOE, but there's a lot of things that cascade from that as well too, right? Which is, how do you look at the intersection of different sectors and how it supports the, the, the child? Because so many of us teachers are held responsible only for the school day to make sure we solve all the problems within that school day. That's not possible. So the deal we can really help us connect the dots and look at the whole child and see all the intersections, all the learning environments in which a child lives and help us make those connections. And the ramifications there around the, the intersection of data, right? So when you look at data interoperability, when you look at data governance, all that stuff becomes really meaningful. And there are not always things a local leader can do, but that can be enabled by a larger set of, set of issues. So one redefining success 
The second thing I would push is that the, the, the incentives have to be around looking at transitions as we play the long game. Much of my work now is focused on P16 work. And I'll tell you, I've learned a lot about what it takes to bring different actors, different sectors together to look at the journey of a child. I mean, as parents, I mean, I have four children. We play the long game. And I live P16. I have a kid in college and one in kindergarten. So we play the long game. So we watch the entire progression. And so helping local leaders really understand what that means, frankly, and how we are incentivized. So one concrete way, for example, is that we are times held accountable for high school graduation, but not held accountable for college persistence. Uh, I'm not saying that the universities and colleges shouldn't be held accountable for being ready to receive those kids, but certainly high school graduation, we know is not the end game. It is, again, part of the pathway. So how do we look at those kinds of issues? There are things like credit mobility that we can talk about as well too. And one thing like that is irking me a lot, which we've not talked about, is the high school to post-secondary transition. If you saw the recent news headline from the New York Times from the National Student Data Clearinghouse, a quarter of all community college kids did not show up in the fall. I know how much we know about, folks know about the data of kids who graduate high school, accepted mm -hmm. the university, but in that summer, don't show up to college. So that transition is a big deal. And we're losing in all the kids, frankly, who are not the kids who are middle income, all the kids who are parents who understand how to navigate the system. How do you enable that is really, really important. Two more things, please. Okay, John. One is um, we also have to begin to focus on the shift in power dynamics. Right now, the systems own all the power. How do you shift that and put power in the hands of kids? And there are concrete ways I'm seeing that actually happening. There's a great program right now in Dallas called the Greenlight Project that really gives students and families ownership of the data um, to really sophisticated sort of uh, um, using um, uh, Salesforce, using these, uh, these data lockers where the kids have now ownership of this link that has their entire portfolio and they're managing the system. So how do we shift the power dynamic? Do you have this one way of allowing families to manage the system versus just waiting for the system to respond uh, um, to kids? I think there's, there's, there's a part maybe I can also talk about quickly. Um, as, as now living in a foundation and seeing how maybe the world's largest foundation works, who cares and spends a lot of money on education every single year, nearly a billion dollars in education a year. But when we see what we actually do is that we care about systems change. Uh, we look for these kinds of actors. We look for the intersection of government, local, national, state, and where we can play and say, we're going to unlock dollars and catalyze change to make sure it is long lasting. So philanthropic organizations are very interested in this conversation, spending a lot of money, but they like to spend it in ways that really looks at the ways of changing systems to enable and unlock potential in the system. Yeah, philanthropy is so important. I think uh, back, you know, over a decade ago, we had a race to the top. It was the philanthropic community who provided funds to states to say, put together a team, put together an application, and then they even paid for consultants to come in to help departments of education and others. And so there's definitely a philanthropic role. So glad you brought up the high school to college handoffs. The billions we spend on college remediation is amazing. And yet we told families, you have a high school diploma, you are what, drum roll, college Ready. <laughs> And too many low-income students in particular take one, two, three, four semesters of non-college bearing courses, assume debt, and let's just say they leave, that's a whole other story. The systems piece is interesting. You mentioned Fulham, I think of Carl White in an article that he wrote many years ago on uh, loosely coupled schools and how businesses are able to do things because they're tightly coupled, schools are loosely coupled, and it's tough to do. I definitely agree that Department of Education could play a role. And, there's definitely some ways philanthropy can play a role in assisting because some things you don't want DOE to involve in just because of the process itself. So Melody, you were in DOE. You brought in classroom experience. Talk to us a little bit more about what it was like to be a fellow. And there's gonna be other fellows who are gonna come in. Uh, knowing what you know right now, what would you recommend to the new leadership team as they look for fellows and as fellows think about coming in? Yes, um, I love this question. Um, and first, I would just love to say, you know, when you're talking about the uh, amount of money and time that's spent with remedial skills in college, um, that's something that we talk about a lot at Ed Reports. And it's really one of the problems that contributes to that is the uh, lack of access to high quality instructional materials. And we have, um, you know, teachers using curriculum or resources that are not at grade level, um, that are not aligned to standards. 
Um, and then they're spending, you know, seven to 12 hours a week, either creating their own resources or searching for them online. And that just really creates gaps in learning and inconsistencies. And so part of the reason that that's happening when they get to college is that they're spending hours upon hours in the classroom um, doing work that's really not, um, you know, not to the level of rigor or not to the level of standards that they should be. Um, so just something that we're very passionate about and hope that, um, you know, there can be a conversation around what we're giving teachers to be able to meet their students' needs. Um, so that can help them focus on other things like social emotional learning, um, you know, uh, culturally relevant resources um, and, you know, differentiating for their students. Um, so um, as far as the fellowship, um, we really saw ourselves as connectors. Um, we were connecting the department to the teachers in the field. Um, and then we were connecting the teacher voice in the field and bringing that to the department. And, you know, uh, I recognize that not everybody knows the, the role of the federal department of ed um, in education. And so really helping people understand what they do and what they don't do. Um, and knowing, you know, what, what decisions happen at the federal level versus what happens at the state level um, was something that, you know, I saw people come in and passionately share their stories and advocate for something so important, only to learn that, you know, that was due to a state law or a state policy. So, so the fellowship was really about helping people better understand um, what they do at the department, and then also just really bringing um, that educator voice, you know, so many people that work at the department are educators or have been educators, but many are not. Um, a lot of them have never um, done work in the classroom outside of being a student. So it was really important to be able to share your experiences and then share the experiences of others um, and really just trying to convey what was really happening in schools, not, you know, what was um, being portrayed as happening in schools. Um, and, you know, I really learned you have to be open minded and you really have to come to the table and listen to someone who has opposing views and try to understand their perspective, because um, I can say definitely everybody who was at the department when I was there for both years um, really did have the best interest of students in mind and really maybe just had a different approach to what they thought was best for students. And so I always was just trying to listen. Um, to understand somebody's perspective and then do my best to help them understand my perspective or the perspective of, you know, other educators or my perspective as a parent. Um, I think that a lot of times there's just breakdowns in communication or there's such a, a wild, you know, uh, gap between actually being in a school and then being at the federal level um, mm -hmm. that we need some people who can come in there and, and really help to show um, the truths and the issues and bring solutions. Um, so again, I, I hope that this administration and the people at the department will bring in as many teachers as possible and listen to what they have to say because we really do know what works best for students and we really do know what needs to change. So uh, follow-up uh, questions. Were you assigned to a particular division or department within ed? And because you had a chance to work with Obama and transition to Trump administration, what were some of the differences or similarities? Yes. Yeah, so um, when I first started the fellowship, we were in the Office of Communications and Outreach. And then it shifted um, as the transition happened to the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education. And so the roles changed, right? The first year we were um, thinking about communications and um, writing blogs and hosting events where we could bring in different stakeholders and have round tables um, and you know, thinking about social media. Um, uh, really just, again, how to communicate what the department does and then what educators need for our students. Um, and then uh, it shifted to a little bit more grant focused and that was really an opportunity to learn about um, you know, the ins and outs of what happens at the department. Uh, so it was a big learning experience and I found the transition to be fascinating. You know, it was so interesting to be somewhere where half of the people are gonna stay and half the people are gone within a day. <laughs> and the amount of time that it takes for new people to come in and to be assigned and to get to know the work and to get to know the career employees. Um, so I just think about, you know, if you have a four year term I think maybe the first year is spent starting over. Um, and I actually think that's 
you know, something I hope can change. And I hope that change can happen a little bit more quickly. Um, but again, I did really feel like the people that I came across were, um, you know, passionate about what they were doing and felt like they were doing um, what was best. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think each administration is an opportunity, again, to rethink education and to innovate new ways to solve really, really long lasting problems. Um, so I'm hopeful for that, but it was definitely fascinating and a, a life-changing experience where I don't think I ever could learn more from something um, than those two years at the department. I'm glad you mentioned the point about how little most of us know about the Federal Department of Education. So DeBose, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going that route now. That, that's fine. <laughs> you, were, you were in a similar position. Uh, talk to us about uh, what you learned, what you were involved in, uh, and knowing what you know today, what would you say to the administration? Yeah, so many, it's so one, I mean, I feel like I'm kind of walking down memory lane in this conversation because my um, year at the Department of Ed was, was one of the most powerful years of my life. I mean, I learned so much um, and I made some really wonderful connections with other educators and with folks at the department. So. Uh, you know, Professor Robinson, when you were sharing about all the lawyers, it's like, I, I shout out to all the career employees at the department. I think of like Phil Rosenfeld, uh, you know, in uh, the office of the general counsel and other people who are, who really have been there for decades and are doing this really powerful work for those of us that come in for these shorter amounts of time. Like they really are that foundation. Um, so, uh, you know, when I became a department uh, teaching ambassador fellow, I was based in Washington with four other fellows and it was a huge learning curve for us. You know, we were educators from, I was from the Bronx. Uh, we had folks from Boston, New Mexico, uh, Maryland and New Jersey. And we, uh, you know, were the five that were there and I was placed in the office of the secretary um, and I was working specifically uh, with the amazing uh, Greg Darneter around looking specifically at middle school uh, reform and middle school and, and why middle school matters uh, and, and how oftentimes middle schools are, you know, we're often forgotten. Um, but then also looking, you know, the similar to what Melody was describing, ensuring that educator voices and experiences and the diversity of our experiences were present at, in, you know, in that office building um, in Washington. And one, one piece uh, that really stands out to me um, so much from my time was uh, around Teacher Appreciation Week, one of the assistant secretaries of education said, hey, you know, fellows, like, what can we do at the federal level to show teachers across the country that we appreciate them? And usually, you know, sometimes people will make phone calls and the secretary will write notes. And, and um, it took me back to uh, a time when, I think it was my third year of teaching my dad who was a university professor shadowed me for two days in my classroom. And at the end of those days, he was exhausted. He was spent, he was, he was, <laughs> it was very funny, but he was like, I cannot believe how hard you work. I have never worked this hard in my life. And this is my dad, you know, who, who's, who's had many work experiences. Um, and that really stuck, um, stuck with me because it, it, many of us, you know, as Melody said, said there's lots of people in the department who have been educators but there are so many who have not and even when you've been an educator when you are not in the day-to-day -day teaching you can forget real quick how hard this work is right and so we launched uh something called ed goes back to school because the department they call it ed and um we facilitated basically for career and political uh, employees in DC and across the country to shadow a teacher for a day and they shadowed a teacher for a day and then we brought those teachers and the people who shadowed them back to the department for a debrief with Secretary Duncan and that debrief was powerful because I remember one person in the department who was a high-ranking political appointee moved to tears who said you know he, he had shadowed a high school teacher in DC um, she was a high school theater teacher and he was there with her in her period one class and I think seven kids were there and he said where are the rest of your students and she's like I have about 30 kids on my roster but normally like I get seven to eight every period one and for him 
that was a real awakening because he was like, how are we holding this teacher accountable for her student's success when her students aren't even there? And that's not her fault. And for those of us who were educators, we were like, that's obvious to us, but not to somebody who may not be thinking about uh, that, the day-to-day -day of a school. And so I, I just cannot emphasize enough how valuable it is for folks who are working in policy to regularly be in classrooms. And, and I know it's important that we bring teachers to the policy people, but we policy folks need to go to teachers, right? And they need to be in schools and shadowing principals and shadowing students, um, you know, to see like how, how much does a kid sit in a day? Kids just sit a lot. <laughs> so, you know, that's exhausting. And so what, just to be in the, on the ground in the work. Um, and that was our role as fellows to really, you know, make that, make that build that bridge. Um, and I, I just, I just emphasize for, for this new administration to really ensure that, you know, you step out of that building and you step into schools at least monthly because things change. And especially in the timing that we're in now, if schools are in a virtual setting, you are, you know, with a teacher in their Zoom class, seeing how it's going, uh, because um, it's hard, you know, and, and the people who are making the policy really need to know how, um, how it is on the ground. So that, that to me is, is one of my favorite memories from the department and, and the power that the, the program continued, you know, they continued to do that, uh, I, at least I know for the next few years um, during every teacher appreciation week. Oh, you're muted, uh, Gerard. You mentioned that you were in the DC office. Um, did you connect, or you, Melody, I don't know if you ever connect with people in the regional office, because of course there's the national office in DC, but there's a regional office in Atlanta. There's one in Boston. Yeah, absolutely. And and the, the, the beauty of the fellowship, uh, I know it's shifted some over the years, but the year that I was there, there were five of us who were based in DC. And there were 10 of us who were based at our school sites and would come. Okay. Um, and so we were, so there were 15 fellows in total. Um, and then, you know, folks who were based at their school sites, we would come together a couple times a year as a, a whole cohort. But we did um, connect with folks in regional offices uh, in Boston, in New York, um, in other places to, to uh, you know, share, learn of what the work that they were doing at the regional level, and then also share the work that we were doing. When we did a number, um, Secretary Duncan always had a, a back to school uh, bus tour. And so we, we would travel across the country, uh, you know, having round tables with teachers, connecting with regional offices to really say, hey, here's, here's communicating, like Melody said, here's what the department is about. What do you want the department to know? Um, you know, that's our role as teaching ambassador fellows to really ensure that your voices are, are alive in, in those policy spaces. Good to know. Jean-Claude. I was just going to just piggyback on that. What, what, what I think you're hearing is the importance of connecting practice with policy. I mean, this, this one example of the, of the, of the art of the theater teacher at the first period, the high school schedule does not work for teenagers, but there's a lot of complexities in changing it. So sometimes you have policymakers who are not connected to the realities of stuff on the ground. They push these edicts and of course it falls flat because the practitioner can certainly explain the complexity of delivery of policy implementation. So Ani Duncan being a former superintendent understood that. So we have a new secretary who also is coming from those ranks. So I would urge him to also do the same thing. Keep connecting policymakers with practitioners. And as you mentioned, a new secretary more experience in the classroom than all 11 secretaries uh, combined. He's one of only three to have been a former uh, local superintendent, so he knows that as well. Spent a lot of time in the classroom, and so this is going to bring a lot of uh, gravitas uh, to the point. Um, I've got a few questions that are in the chat right now, and before I go to Q&A, I also want to give some of you an opportunity maybe to respond to something you've heard one of your colleagues say before I open it up to a Q&A or to just follow up on. Well, I one uh, Jean-Claude, when you were talking earlier around, um, you know, the shifting the power dynamic and, um, you know, thinking of the high school to college drop off, it, it just really brought 
uh, for me, uh, an appreciation uh, for my colleagues uh, at the partnership for Los Angeles schools, because we have an amazing college team that has been doing a lot of work specific around that. Um, we have something called the College Compass, where our middle schoolers, our kindergartners are looking at like, hey, how, how, how's my reading? You know, what are my grades? What's my attendance? And families can look at that together and be empowered through that. And, um, you know, just the power of having access to your own data and being able to respond. I've seen that with my middle schoolers when we're looking at, hey, you know, as, if you're reading on grade level, your chances for college success, you know, are this much greater. And we've had kids say, oh, well, I wasn't really taking that reading assessment seriously. Can I take it again? You know, mm -hmm. and that's because they had access to this. And it, and, and even thinking of like, um, you know, the high school to college drop off, you know, we had a program this summer with some of our amazing VISTA core members to, in, to support uh, and keep that group connected so that they did transition from high school to college, especially in this hard time during COVID. So you just really um, helped me, uh, you know, just emphasizing the importance of those pieces and just helped me uh, really shine out some some appreciation for my team and the work that they're doing. Thank you. I can just add to, to that stream. So two things. One is if you guys know EL education, they're all about this idea of student enablement, student empowerment, right? So they foster a sense of belonging uh, at the school level in the student body. So if you look at the schools, this is what they're all about. But I had a discussion a few a few months ago with Diane Tavener, who runs Summit Public Schools. And we're asking her, so how are you thinking about learning loss in the COVID era? How are you thinking, what is going on? She goes, what do you mean? We always know where our kids are all the time. And more importantly, they know where they are all of the time. They're driving um, in their education agenda. So this idea of really using robust, again, keep going back to this idea of really having a great learning management system that brings together the academic, the social emotional sort of uh, learning into sort of one set of work that students own and they own their development, they own their trajectory, and they can tell you exactly where, where they are, what they need in terms of intervention. That kind of power, I think, just puts, again, the, the ownership in the student's hand to really navigate the systems, whereas so many of us focus on just changing the system. To me, it's a both end set of scenarios. All right, what I'm gonna do is um, open it up to those who are watching. You can raise your virtual hand, and I will call on you in the order in which you appear. I have one question sent to me from uh, Dr. Kathleen Amans. She's a professor at Albany State University in Georgia. Uh, her question is really for anyone. If an equal system, uh, in an equal system, all students are given the same resources and in an equitable system, resources are given to students based on their individual needs. What do you think about the aim of Brown v. Board or what, what was it? And really how's it relating to the equity equality issue of today? And it's open to anyone. I'll jump in um, on Brown because I, I teach that to my students all the time. So, you know, Brown really was tackling quite a Herculean task of an entirely separate society. Um, and it was doing it with just nine people to, ta to tackle it. So this, you know, trying to end separate but equal, it did a very incomplete job in the sense of it, it merely declared separate but equal unlawful, but really did not adopt a robust um, understanding of equal educational opportunity, despite the language and the opinion of saying that that should, is what should be provided. And unfortunately, to this day, federal law does not have a robust understanding of equal educational opportunity. It is, mm -hmm. it is um, lacking in federal law and policy. And so this is something I write about extensively about the need for, you know, adopting a federal approach that says we have to provide all children um, equal education opportunity and a high quality education. And so the idea is just saying that, you know, this is not negotiable. You have to provide it. How states choose to provide it should be flexible. In other words, a lot of innovation and experimentation at the state level and delivery, but not being able to choose high quality education or not, not being able to choose disadvantaging poor kids and disadvantaging children of color. We are, we've tolerated that for far too long. And so Brown really only got the conversation started. It, and I think unfortunately what's taught in schools is what people actually believe as adults, which is that, well, we took care of that in Brown. It's like, well, no, we didn't. We, did, we only got started. I think the, 
One of the silver linings in this moment, I try to find some silver lining in the difficult times we're living in. And one is that people are becoming more and more aware of the longstanding impact of systemic racism. And it is alive and well and living in our schools in ways that we need to dismantle. But I think the, that we are starting to shine a spotlight on this and getting some agreement. You know, you, you, you get less of the pushback of, no, 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 race is no longer an issue. People don't say that as much today, living this moment. Um, it's more about, okay, we've got a race problem. Let's figure out what to do about it. And that's a great place to start, to move forward with some law and policy reform, education reform, all kinds of reform. So that's an, that's an exciting thing about this new administration coming in. They have a real opportunity to capitalize on that moment and the moment will not last forever. So they really do need to you know, double down on moving forward. You mentioned the Brown v. Board, and I go to you, John. You know, think about where DOE was around this time. You know, it's 1950s. You know, at one point, DOE was in a separate department, and then it became the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. It only became a standing department, you know, in 1980. And so the Department of Education, in fact, has been changing along with the maturation of how we talk about race and equity along the way. So it's just interesting to see how the institutions are responding or not as we go forward. Jean-Claude? No, I, I, I agree. And I, I agree it was the beginning of a conversation. One of the things, again, as a former local leader, I look at is the ways in which disparities show up perhaps um, in, our, in my school systems. So this idea of root cause, right? So you see inequitable outcomes in education. You see an anemic post-secondary graduation rate, the kids getting really bad access to the world of work. But when you do and you begin to unpack, you find things like you know the financial systems, right? That support schools are really inequitable. And it's not just really what is coming from the state, but what school systems do themselves. There was a recent article I was sort of interviewed for where I was describing my experience in watching two identical schools, same demographics, but one principal knew how to navigate the central office, was getting double the per people funding than the other. So when you look at the, the, the kind of inequities within the system, it basically sort of perpetuates what you see coming out on the other end, right? So it's access to great teachers, access to quality curriculum. I know now they would work at Ed Reports, right? It's great, great standards, great curriculum, great pedagogy but also the kind of support kids need often don't exist. I was asked once in Rochester, why do you have 18,000 dollars per people? What do you do with that? I said, I have pre-K down to three-year-olds. I have two teachers in my pre-K classrooms and that doesn't exist in a place like Chicago, right? So when you look at what, what dollars do and the ways in which the system is really inequitable, you begin to understand what folks will do when you have uh, malicious compliance around the federal policy or federal law uh, and how they get around the system to really perpetuate the kinds of inequities you see in systems. Okay. Anyone else? All right, this question is for Melody. Uh, I love the idea of reimagining schools, albeit our parents, unions, teachers, children, policymakers, et cetera, willing to shift their educational paradigm and truly move forward with innovative solutions. What are your thoughts? I absolutely think they would be willing to make shifts if they were part of the planning process. Okay. So anytime there's any sort of um, barriers, it's often because people feel that changes are being forced on them and that the people who are making those changes don't really understand what they need. And we've you know, spoken about this multiple times through this last hour. So if unions are brought to the table and asked, how would you like to see things change um, that could be helpful for your teachers and their classrooms, um, they'll share really great ideas. And so will parents, especially now after parents have spent this last year being co-teachers, essentially. They, they know better now than they ever did before what their students need, what their, um, you know, what things their kids are using, learning, what their gaps are. So ask the parents what worked for your children. Ask the students, how is school going for you? How is this impacting you? What, what is um, something that you think could be beneficial for you? So I really think that people are very open to change, especially now, and this is the moment, but they have to be part of the discussions around change. Um, and, you know, I really say we've come a long way in bringing teachers to the table to hear their voices, but we have not come to the point where they're part of decision making. And now I feel that's not only for teachers. I feel parents should be part of that. And I feel students should be part of that and all stakeholders because, you know, our business leaders 
everybody is impacted by how strong our education system is. And so if we get input from them, and then we start to make changes really based on that input with transparent understanding of why these changes are being made, um, I think everybody would be willing to make those shifts and move away from you know, what we've done for the last 100 years. Anyone else want to weigh in? It was for Melody, uh, Melody but anyone else can weigh in. OK, here's another question. And this one uh, relates to student attendance. Uh, so earlier, so you talked about students and the challenges with them attending. What recommendations or policies can you recommend DOE implement to try to address attendance, which is also issues of truancy? And it's a much larger issue than we think. What can DOE do? So can I just I'll jump on that if, it, if it's okay. So there's there's this issue of attendance in this virtual environment, this, for the pre-existing conditions around attendance. Let me just say that uh, Heidi King at Attendance Works does a lot of work on, on, on this right now. She's focusing on not just attendance, but what does engagement look like in a virtual environment? So something frankly, a lot of us should take a look at. So what that means, because you click the show button on a, on a platform, it doesn't mean they are engaged in the learning process whatsoever. So the example, I think that, that uh, Jamie, if you have, I'll, I'll use your say that way, if that's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> talked about with the DC issue, there's one of the way in which we schedule the high school schedule, right? When I was a high school teacher, I, I used to dread getting period one, please don't give me period one, because I knew I would get like half my kids showing, it would be a battle to get them to actually come even though they wanted to be there. So there's that kind of reality around the research of what we know about teenagers and how early we, we make them come to school. Um, so. But there's also this um, this issue on root cause of attendance, right? If it's an elementary school kid, the issue is not with the kid, it's with the parents and family. What is happening there is preventing a second grader from coming to school on time. If it's high school, it's something a little bit different, right? So, so you, have, you have to slice the issue and look at the root causes. What I would argue about the DOE, what they could do, is not necessarily get involved in pushing policy from DC to fix this, but really educate local leaders as to what how, how to look at the root cause, the, the, the potential solutions that we know exist and to support local leaders in implementing sort of structures and policies um, and practices that can begin to solve this. I have seen things as bad as school kids, schools suspending kids for being absent. Think about that for a second. They don't want to be there in the first place. And you're going to suspend for doing that. I mean, there's so much to unpack there, Gerard. And I would also argue too that at times you see kids who are in school condos, especially in the high schools. They live in the cafeteria, they live in you know, other parts of the building, they're leaving school early. And I would argue it's the, it's the how engaging the curriculum is. And I think two points I made earlier um, about kids sitting all day. Uh, I mean, I've had teachers shadow kids in ninth grade. They come back and said, oh my God, if I were to do this every day, I'd commit suicide. Uh, I mean, when you think about the engagement, what we do to kids, and again, not teachers' fault, but it's a very structure how we think about high school uh, or middle school for that matter is what we have to think about. But the DOE can really educate local leaders using the power of IES and others to really bring those kinds of best practices so folks understand what perhaps they could do to shift the, the paradigm that we have existing right now. Yep. I just want to add on to that um, because I feel I, I feel I, I couldn't agree more in terms of the power of engagement impacting attendance. And I can speak really only from a secondary level uh, as a, a middle school uh, educator, but really even thinking about how much similar to what Melody had shared earlier, you know, when people are part of the process, <clears throat> they are far more likely to come along, they're far more likely to be engaged. And it's the same with our students and thinking about how, especially I think in these times when, you know, it's hard to get kids to turn on their cameras and be with you in that virtual space. You know, how are we creating opportunities for kids to co-plan their, their learning, right? And those are some things that we've done at my school site now and I've done in the past where kids get to plan units with their teachers, where they get to have say and what texts are selected, what activities we'll do, because then they are, hey, I, oh, today's the day we're doing this. I help plan that. I will be there. I will be active. And so I, I can't emphasize enough. There are so many great practices happening around the country. So how could somebody like the Department of Ed really, you know, utilize um, their knowledge and their um, their span to say, 
here are some of the best practices, bringing people together to learn uh, together. That, that I think in my time at Ed was, were some of the most powerful pieces when people from different states were coming together to learn together and then to, to problem solve and then go back to their respective states and LEAs to do the work and then check back in. So that, that, that engagement piece is huge when it comes to getting kids to show up. You, Jean, and uh, Jean-Claude and Melody have all mentioned the part about inclusion, bringing people to the table. Uh, in an op-ed I wrote some years ago about the forum in New Jersey, I used the term FUBU, for us, without us. And it seems to be a trend that we'll do this for someone else without us and then wonder why people aren't involved. All three of you are saying, let's make sure you're engaged. I've got a, a question I'm gonna ask you to be our closing question. We haven't spent a great deal of time talking about money. Uh, we know that of all the money that we spend in education, 10% comes from the Department of Education, major investor in Title I funds used for uh, our lower income families, Title II funds used to uh, support educators and professional development. With COVID-19 in March, first round, you found 13 billion. Uh, this new round, you know, nearly five times as much coming to schools. Schools, states at least, have a lot of money, more than they've had any at one time. Uh, President uh, Biden administration thinking of actually putting uh, more money in. If you're to talk to teachers, if you're to talk to superintendents, if you're to talk to the only employees who are going to have to manage this, what should they be thinking with just a large infusion of class, uh, cash? And, and of course, there's bureaucracy has got to go through. But there's a lot of money on the table. What can we do to avoid two things? One, uh, not making, uh, not getting into the right place at the right time. And number two, just assuming it will always be there. We know that federal policy will calcify before the cash uh, runs out. What do you recommend? Um, Kimberly, we'll, we'll start with you. What are your thoughts? So here I'm gonna agree with Jean-Claude that I really think the trauma that children is dealing with has to be prioritized. You can't try to make up reading losses or math losses while a kid is really suffering with mental health crises and food insecurity and, and those things. So I think, you know, you're just not gonna reach them that way. So I think we've got to address the fact that many of our children are in crises. Parents have lost jobs, people are homeless. We've gotta deal with that social um, and emotional health piece. And then in terms of kind of uh, investing and focusing resources, you know, low-income communities, children with special needs, and um, English language learners seem to be uh, the hardest hit by this pandemic. And so I think a focus on them and increasing resources to those children and communities of color would be, um, would be what I would recommend in terms of top parties and, and where to focus the funds. Um, and in addition to, I, I agree also with John Claude's point about the digital divide. I think that's really critical. Um, any particular advice to attorneys and ask in part because this is also a situation where you can have a lot of litigation. We're suing school systems, we're suing states because they're not doing X, Y, and Z when state leaders are saying, yes, but I'm trying to. And the money we could have used for the students you're talking about, we use litigation. What's the recommendations? You know, it's interesting. There is a lot of litigation happening. It's just mushrooming all over the country. We're seeing these lawsuits about school closures or what's happening this fall. You know, I I mean, they're, they're, obviously the, the state departments are gonna have to defend those cases. I think that the courts are likely to defer to um, state departments and governors about what should or shouldn't happen. I don't think that the courts are really gonna be the answer um, and are really gonna step in here to, to address the, the critical needs in part because courts really don't wanna be education policymakers. They don't wanna be you know, the schoolhouse is in the court. And so I, I will be very surprised if these issues really play out robustly in courts. I think courts are gonna defer and be fairly hands-off on this issue. I think you'll, you know, you'll find at the margins some courts that are willing to weigh in. So I'm actually watching that litigation very closely to see what theories might emerge under a state right to education for, for remedies for children. I do think the states could, the state courts or federal, the state courts could be open to remedial education, in other words, closing schools, not reopening, they might be willing to, to put some remedies in place that require remedial education, but I think they will do that only in kind of extreme cases and in learning losses. They're not going to step in, the courts won't step in and, and micromanage the, the districts and the, the states. They'll, they'll want to stay out of it. 
Melody, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that reprioritizing funding is really important. I just think about how much money is spent on, you know, um, standardized testing, teacher evaluations, things that really in the scheme of things right now currently don't matter as much as addressing, you know, learning gaps and learning losses and um, uh, trauma and all of the other things that we know we're facing right now. So we, we are getting additional money, but I think it's time to go back again and reimagine how we're spending the money that we have in the first place um, and thinking about what is most important to students first and then moving on from there. Um, and I see somebody mentioning um, IDA in the comments. Um, I know that's federally, but that has never been funded um, to the extent where it should be to be able to meet the standards. And then that trickles down to the states um, and I've actually been through due process with our school district and have experienced that as a parent. And part of the problem in Michigan is that the way our funding is structured, um, the districts are not getting the money that they need for special education and therefore they're taking shortcuts or putting, you know, uh, putting kids in self-contained classrooms rather than, um, you know, including kids in general ed. So there are just so many things where, again, the funding needs to be looked at and looking at what comes first and then what really can go to the wayside now that we're in a totally different world. A graduate school paper I wrote many years ago looked at the 1990s change to Michigan funding formula. Um, and oh yeah, so we're still dealing with that. Okay, the reimagining, I like that. Jean-Claude, what are your thoughts? I'll be, I'll be quick to, you know, so when I've been a part of some of these lawsuits, the Campaign for Fiscal Equity in New York I was a, a part of that. Let me just say that there are models and the one I'm looking at right now and I've been a part of as well is House Bill 3 in Texas that bought over $7 billion education in, in, across the state of Texas. When you look at the policy and how, in, in of course, the policy looked at implementation, but, but the way, reason why you see this through line is because there was a coalition of leaders across the state led by Dallas, the Commit Partnership in Dallas, who took this to Austin and got it passed. So you see, you see implementation and you see policy construct really well aligned. So I would argue, look at HB3 and you'll see that kind of comprehensive look. Uh, but yes, to Professor Robinson's point, there's some critical infrastructure work we've got to do immediately, but House Bill 3 is a great example of how that can be done. Okay. Boys. And I would just, I mean, I'm echoing a lot of what folks are saying, but really uh, a need to focus on our most high need kids um, and communities um, and to really think uh, through how do we um, support, how do we put funding where uh, to create more back to the earlier point around equal versus equitable uh, to create more equitable uh, environments and learning experiences for kids. So really just focusing on our, our highest need uh, students who have been who have been hit, hit hardest traditionally, but even more so by this pandemic. Well, thank you for joining me in this conversation from what you just said and other comments. What I take away from this is the importance of making sure we have students and their engagement and their involvement in voice uh, at the local level. Um, although I taught, um, fifth grade uh, in my first uh, teaching career, middle school matters a lot. And the challenges that we see in high school, they didn't all of a sudden have challenges with reading or mathematics in grade 10, when 70% of the students who drop out do so there. A lot of that stuff is in the middle. And so thank you so much for your work in the middle. Jean-Claude, thank you so much for your leadership uh, from the system level, bringing in both policy practice, but also research. Congratulations on your new role. Glad to see your voice into the digital space uh, that we're going to have. Uh, Melody, thank you for joining. What I take away <clears throat> from you is the importance of also remembering not only families, but those who have special needs, uh, those who really don't understand how to often navigate the system. And we forget, and both of you who are fellows have talked about the importance of education and what it can do. And in fact, the Department of Ed, there are a number of programs in place. We know Title I, Title II, IDEA and other, but they're actually institutionalized programs lower on the rank who actually have funding and resources to work with teachers and educators to address some of these issues. Kimberly, for your work of talking about the insides of a general counsel's office, Department of Education, you just mentioned about education and the civil rights. I know you have a new law review article that just appeared at the Indiana Law Journal two days ago about a civil rights and education uh, and from the state level perspective. And since you took away my uh, uh, little quiver in the beginning, I was gonna say thank you so much for joining us. I know your husband, 
He's a man of long suffering. I was, I'm going to pray for him, but I can't say that now because everyone knows the story. So with that, let me thank all of you who joined us for the Center for Education, Leadership and Culture here at the Advanced Studies and Culture Foundation in Charlottesville. Uh, see you next month where we will have more conversations. Keep up the good work. Happy New Year. And for those who are in the administration, know that we're here uh, to be thought partners as you do what you can for millions of students who are learning in public schools, private school, at home, virtual, higher ed, and other ecosystems. Take care. Thanks for having me. Thank you.